Hey, we're live. It's a little after seven. What time is it? Just check, check, check it out. Seven oh six ish, according to my, for my hand dandy uh, computer clock. <laughs> uh, we're here at West Tech Performance. If you hope, hopefully everybody saw the video. If you haven't, go check out the video that I posted on going the 4.2 liter Atlas, the Amerabera. <laughs> I'm sure the Australian guys are getting tired of hearing that. Um, it's just kind of cool though. It's, it's interesting that that's a four liter and some four, this is a 4.2 liter it's from GM ones like Australian, Australia's kind of darling motor and it, and it works very well. I can't wait to try to test one of those. This is awesome because there's lots and lots of them in the wrecking yard. When I go to the wrecking yard today, I was just commenting to somebody earlier that when I went to the wrecking yard, I actually saw more of these 4.2 liters than I saw LS motors in the wrecking yard. So it just goes to show you how many they made. And 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 although maybe it also shows you that not as many people are taking these out of the wrecking yard as they are taking the LS stuff. But there's a lot to choose from. And most of them that I saw were the earlier version. So pre-2005. Um, and then there were only, I think that there were only two and those were both 2006 motors, one of which I took, <laughs> and I probably should have picked the other one. But that's why we did a compression test on this one before we took it out of the wrecking yard, and that was geysering oil all over. And now we might see, why, I mean, the motor was, the vehicle that we got this from was flipped over. So we're, we're, what we're suspecting is it was flipped over, and then oil drained past the rings into the, into the combustion chambers. And then when we cranked the motor over, it shot it out. The other thing that's happening, and this is something that happened when we were running this thing under boost and i didn't notice it when we ran the motor na and so that leads me to believe that maybe that's from blow by and crankcase pressure um we filled basically the spark plug holes up with oil so maybe um maybe these have this particular motor two things could be happening one it could be it could have a you know bad valve cover seals which is fairly common and i'm told um by jerry that that's why GM went away from this plastic valve cover is because it didn't seal very well. So they went to the um, cast aluminum version and that's supposed to seal much better. And if this is any indication, maybe that's, but the other thing is that this has had a, probably had a lot, a lot of hard miles. It's also been heated up a lot. Um, and maybe we don't know, maybe it's never been off and never changed. So I, I don't know how many miles you can expect something like that to last without servicing it at least. So, you know, maybe I just need to take a look at it and put some fresh, um, fresh seals in it and maybe it will be fine. We'll just have to see. But the other thing that I want to look at, and, and I think that this is one of the things that we found out when I was testing and unfortunately, you know, I wish I would have had more time. But one of the things that we found out is I, this thing, like the LS motors that I run, certainly needs more like breather. It needs more PCB. It needs to get that stuff out. And when I do the LS motors, a lot of guys run the factory PCB system, and that's not nearly enough. So what I do on the LS motors is I'll take the factory valve cover, and we have a big hole in it, and we just vent that out to atmosphere. Um, we did a test with the factory stuff where we use um you know the tiny orifice that the factory uses and, and i know that on the later model ones there's one coming out of the um center valley cover and then one coming out of the driver side and then there's another one that has the valve in it coming out of the passenger side but we get when i don't ever even run them on the dyno like that we take that we take that passenger side one off and then i have one that we use that's the dyno valve cover <laughs> and it's got like a three quarter AN fitting stuck inside a rubber grommet. And then I just run a big length of heater hose off of it. So I'm thinking that I'm gonna do something similar to this valve cover. I did have a hose connected to the, you know, the PCB nipple there up on top of the valve cover, but I don't think that that opening's big enough. And I might even look at doing another one. The nice thing about the modification that I made to this when I had the turbo up higher and I was draining the oil into the oil cap, into the filler cap, is that now I have a hole there. So all I need to do is twist in a fitting and then voila, I have two breathers. And, and after I drill the standard PCB out and make it bigger, I think that that will probably be enough. Um, the other thing is obviously one of the things I did do when I was running this is there are, um, there's a PCB hole in the head basically. And then that goes up into the intake manifold that's connected by a little U-shaped piece of tubing. 
And what I did was put a longer piece of tubing there because that piece was all brittle and cracked, put a longer piece of tubing and then I just kinked it so that it didn't, we wanted to obviously not have a vacuum leak there. And we did not want to have boost going down into to pressurize the crankcase. So um, I'm hoping that I pinched that enough that this thing did seem to have when it was under high boost, seemed to have a little bit of blow by, not a ton, but some, and then <laughs> the, and the way that I made that go away is put the long piece of tubing on, run the tubing all the way back to the dyno, then it's out of sight, out of mind, then you can't even see it. Um, so uh, the other thing I wanted you guys to look at is this is the, this is the alternative turbo setup for the, the, our Amera Barra here. Factory exhaust manifold, and then we just have a simple, actually this started out as the piece of pipe that we got from the wrecking yard because when they cut the exhaust off to get rid of the cats they just got a big scissor machine and it just snips the end of it off so jason at jt fab just welded on this elbow so that i could adapt another elbow and then mount the turbo and then we've got the wastegate and and so eagle-eyed viewers probably will notice that um <laughs> what's wrong with this configuration <laughs> Yeah, the turbo cannot be rotated, so um, it's facing the wrong direction. But don't worry, I have a cure for that. What we're going to do is I have another one of these elbows that has a three-inch V-band on it that will allow me then to go from a V-band to whatever turbo that we want, and then we can, we can orient that any way we want. But one of the things I found out, and I thought that I had already done this, is my 90-degree V-band to V-band piece that I have does not have a wastegate provision on it but that's that's pretty easy we can see you can see it down here we just need to weld a piece of tubing on there with a flange on it and i've got some flanges from the guys over at turbo smart so we can put another one of these on there so all of that that's an easy fix what we want to do is take this turbo i use the cool ability shiny one we want to take this turbo obviously and spin it 90 degrees so it's facing that way and then the exhaust will be facing to the back of the dyno and then we can clock this thing and make the intercooler and all that stuff work the reason that I want to try this one is because the stock exhaust manifold actually did very well in the comparison compared to the long tube header. So it might be that this is more responsive, although I, if I was going to do a street application and I was going to use this, I probably wouldn't go to three inch tubing. I probably would go neck down because the factory is fairly big. It's between two and a half and three. It's two and three quarters. Um, I would neck it down to two and a half. And then I'd go to two and a half, especially if you're going to run. This one is a T3 based turbo, so it's a T3 hot side. So it should be fairly responsive, but there's no reason to have to feed it with a three inch, three inch exhaust, necking it down to, you know, the size of a T3 flange. So a two and a half would be more than enough. And I think that the combination of this stock exhaust manifold and then if we ran a smaller tubing diameter, it probably would improve response even more. I think we could do some of that with the turbo itself. But it would be interesting to see um, what that happens. And I, I do want to, um, in, in the testing coming up, I do want to compare this setup to the long tube header with the same turbo on it. The problem is there's no way to configure it exactly the same. Um, we can run the same turbo on there, but because of the way that they come out and stuff, there's going to be a little bit of a difference in what I have to do to the length of the intercooler piping. Although in the testing before, it didn't show a big difference, but it's important to note. And, you know, guys, will I'm sure will <laughs> make a point of mentioning that. Um, I'm, I'm really kind of interested in trying this turbo because it's a T3 hot side. So, you know, if we do, if we get it set up where everything's working just right and I've solved all the oiling problems and get a proper drain back and do all that, then um, I'm, I'm going to be curious to see the change in response rate between this and the GoTo GT35. I kind of would also like to run a, maybe the guys for max speeding, I have one of their, or I have two of their GT3582s. And that would be interesting because the power that we made last night at like <laughs> two o'clock or 2.30 in the morning. Uh, so, so technically today, um, that power level is kind of right in the wheelhouse of that GT3582. It's, it's getting near the upper limit, I think. But I think that that Turbo 2 would also be very, very responsive. And because they're so inexpensive, a lot of guys will want to know how well does that thing work. So that will be interesting. But I got to solve a couple of issues here. Um, I have the – I'm taking the 06 motor down to the – machine shop so that we can have basically a fresh head, a fresh stock head. I did a bunch of testing today 
on the, uh, and I'm going to send that over to Calvin so he can put it up on the wiki if, if it's not already up there. I, what I did was took the valve springs off of the 06 head and measured the installed height and the seat pressure and the open pressure at some lift value, basically around 400 lift. So we can kind of get an idea on spring rate and the OD and the ID and all that stuff so that I can source. What I did was start looking for a source for an alternate spring. So I need to get an idea where it is and then how much we can go up and how much might be necessary. I'd like to get something that will accept about, you know, would accept 500 lift. I don't know that we will ever run a cam like that. The last thing that I haven't measured yet is uh, because I had to jump on here. I want to measure the retainer to seal clearance and see how much lift the factory setup will allow even regardless of the spring because sometimes you can run into either coil bind or you can run into retain your seal clearance and no matter which one of those that you run into that's going to limit the lift of the of the camshaft so it, those are very important things to check obviously you don't want to get into coil bind and you also don't want the retainer to hit the seal if it hits it just a little bit and it's a, and the top of the seal is rubber you know you might get away with that for a long time but eventually it's just going to tear the seal and it can cause problems so we want to try to solve that and we want to be able to rev the motor and that's one way to do it and also we want to make sure a lot of guys have mentioned and this is one of the things that we were thinking about this we had a list of things that this could possibly be and a couple of the things we checked today because it seemed to be getting a little unstable it seemed to be surging at the top um you know i don't think that the boost controller was having a problem we had it at about 65 to 67 percent duty cycle we were only at 11 pounds we've got a seven pound spring in it so it's not having to adjust a great deal um but we had a little bit of surging i don't know if you guys noticed that the guys that were watching um and there are a lot of things that it could possibly be obviously these holes are filled up with oil um i don't know that they'd be causing a misfire usually the the plug, the wire from the coil pack seals pretty well on the spark plug. So I don't suspect that, you know, I guess it's possible for oil to be getting down in there past the, um, past the plug and past the threads, especially, you know, those are old and they're kind of dirty. So I don't know how well the plug, well, that plug's got to see that they're pretty good. So I guess it probably couldn't be getting in there. Um, that could be causing a problem. We don't know what condition the coil packs are in. We had about four milliseconds of dwell set up in the uh, mega squirt. And so that should be more than enough. We brought the we brought the plug gap down to you know 19 or so, kind of where we run it, and that didn't seem to do anything. We tried the other plugs, we tried the three quarter reach plugs, and that didn't solve it. But it also didn't hurt it any more than it was doing already. So that was interesting. Now I wouldn't run the three quarter uh, reach plugs in there for very long because a lot of the um, a lot of the threads are exposed. So you don't want those getting hot, and you don't want to be, be ruining those threads either. So that's not a good idea, but for a dyno pull, you know, it's not a big deal. It's not going to hurt anything. The other thing that I looked at is the, the injectors that I installed in that motor were 80 pound DECA injectors and they are in the ceiling surface is slightly shorter than the factory plugs. The, um, and I was worried that possibly when you bolt this rail on, because when you bolt the rail on, that determines where the injectors are going to go. I mean, that's kind of a fixed deal. So if the injector is a little bit shorter, which these were, I was worried that maybe it was pushing the um, injector out and, you know, unseating the O-ring and boost was blowing by there. But after looking at that, I don't think that that's really a possibility. Um, so we've got, you know, we've got ignition potential. We've got valve float potential. We, I think we've, decided that the injectors are not it. I even took the motor off and did another leak down on it and the motor seems happy. We've got two cylinders just like we had when we first started that are a little bit lower than the than the other four, but it's not something that I would worry about. You know, one of them isn't at 15 <laughs> or 85% or, or, or leak down. Um, so I, the motor seems healthy. It's not that. Um, the tune seems to be pretty good. The boost curve is consistently flat, um, you know, with the wastegate controller. That's nice. It can do that. <coughs> I think I swallowed a bug. Um, so hey, let me know what you guys think of what are, what are some other possibilities that we might be experiencing? Um, like I said, we're going to take the 06 head in or take the whole motor in. And when we do that, the 06 is going to come back with, um, we're going to take the broken head bolts out. We're going to put ARP head studs in from the LS. 
we are going to obviously do a light surface on the head and do a valve job and make sure that that thing's up to snuff. If I can find valve springs, I'm also going to put valve springs in it and we're going to change the ring gap also. So I, when that thing comes back, I basically want it ready to do testing so that we can try different turbos and, and we can turn the boost up and you know go up farther than we did on this 05 motor. And then the same thing, as soon as we solve whatever the issue is, we're going to turn the boost obviously up on the 05 motor, but the 05 motor is gonna get the same thing. It's going to go in, I, we're gonna put ring gap in it, we're gonna put head studs in it, and we're gonna do all of that stuff to get it ready because I have a series of tests that we wanna do, we wanna try different camshafts like on the 05 we want to try the later camshaft the later head we want to try a ported head and more camshafts but more than that we want to try more boost so ring gap and head studs are a good idea and that way they'll both be kind of ready to do what we can do and you know run the boost up on them because guys want to know you know there's lots of guys out there like the Barra guys when they do one of the one of their motors what they normally do is take it apart put a head gasket on it put a put a a an oil pump, the billet gears in the oil pump, they do springs. This I don't know. I haven't looked to see what the factory spring rate is. I'll have to do some more research on the bear to find out. But they do springs, and then they put it back together and, and run boost on it. And I see a lot of guys uh, mentioning ring gap, and I see some guys not doing ring gap, and I see some guys breaking motors, and it's just the same as everywhere else. You know, that that motor's not magic. And especially if you're con if you're starting with an NA one, and then adding boost to that, as opposed to starting with one of the ones that originally came as a turbo deal. The thing that I would like to test on the Barrett especially, is I would like to compare the log style manifold to the long runner manifold and see where, if anywhere, you know, if you're running at 9,000 RPM or something like some of these crazy deals are, I'm sure that a short runner deal is gonna come into play. But what I wanna see, and I wanna see two things. I wanna see where those things cross over and the other thing I want to see is I really like to run both an NA version of the Barra, which I think we're going to get to do, and one of the turbo versions, I would like to run that NA because I never see that. Everybody just does these modifications and then runs boost on them. And that works great. Obviously, they make a lot of power. But I would like to see the starting point. Like I want to see where the thing, okay, how much NA power did it make? Because then I know, okay, as a multiplier, if we started out at, 250 horsepower and then we start multiplying yeah it's doing what it's supposed to or was it 300 and then then it and then it went up and up and up so that's what i want to see on those and i'm i'm hoping that and it looks like from the rated power outputs that if we pick an na barra and start adding boost to that that it should be at least similar to this 05 motor so that'll be a cool comparison and you know we're <laughs> we're not trying to prove that an american motor is better than an australian motor because i love the guys in australia i i'm sure that i love the bear as soon as i get to test it all of those motors are good and so we just want to see where this one goes and where the other one goes because i've never run one of those so any motor that i've never run before obviously i want to jump right in and try it so what are you guys doing and <laughs> what are some suggestions? What do you guys think? What do you guys think happened for you guys that have watched this? Uh, Steve, I do need spring and retainer part numbers. If you've got them, please send them to my email address and I'll, I'll, I'll put that down if you don't have it. Take off my cap locks. It'll be 16 at AOL.com. Yeah, let me know if you have um, if you have spring upgrades for them. I was just looking it up, and then we were looking. Uh, I, I had already looked through the comp stuff. I was checking to see if a set of the um, Acura Integra, you know, B16, B-series stuff, or the single cam, any of that stuff would cross over, but I don't think that it does. So let me know if you guys have something. That's, that's really cool. Oh, Calvin's here, yeah. Uh, Calvin, as a matter of fact, I'll grab my sheet and I'll, I'll just give you an idea what the information that I got so far. But I, I will also I will also send this over to you, Calvin, so that you can, if you want the information. So the information I got on the 4200 Atlas head, this is the 06 head, and I don't know if the 06 and or the earlier heads have a different spring rate since they have a different camshaft. I don't know if they have different springs. 
But what I have is an installed height of 1.375 to 1.38. Um, it has a seat pressure of 64 to 65 pounds, and it has an open pressure at, and I measured this at, at one inch, which is going to be somewhere near um, 400 lift, a little between 375 and 400 lift of 137 pounds. The coil bind is in the 9.94 to 0.93, so you know under under one inch. But that's not a lot of room. That's um, well, that's that's you could get to well, you couldn't get to 500 lift. You could get to 400, 460. Yeah, yeah, not quite 500. No, actually, that's more than that, right? Nine, three, eight. No, that's not. So yeah, you, you can't run a ton of lift. Obviously the factory spring was never designed for that anyways. Um, the free height of the spring is 1.742. The outside diameter is 1.037. And there's room to go bigger on the OD on the spring on the factory um, spring seat. The inside diameter is 710, 711.710, 0.711. The beehive inside diameter is around 5.580, and the retainer measures the the locating um, part of the retainer measures 0 0.570. So it's got a little bit of you know there's a little bit of wiggle room there. Um, I don't have the retainer to seal clearance. I'll I'll, I'll do that after I um, get off on the live feed. So lots of information on the springs and hopefully we can get something, uh, you know, we want to go up maybe, I don't know, 30, 40, 50% in um, spring pressure. Uh, you know, <laughs> maybe guys double it. Let's see. Uh, Mark wanted to know how much do all you're running on the 06 coils? The 06, we're running about four milliseconds right now. Uh, 802 garage. I don't know this thing. Uh, we, we think the two outer ones leak down a little bit lower than the others. And that could be seat wear, which is fairly common on these. Yeah, Sean, I'd like to see the, I always like to see the baseline stuff. And I, I do that when we, before we turbo motor, the other reason I like doing that is not just so that I have the beginning horsepower data, but I also like to make sure that the motor is good. So if, the, if I put the motor together or we've made a change, like we put a camshaft in a junkyard motor and springs and all that, we run it NA, then we know that there are no problems with it before we put the turbo on. So if we have a problem, we don't, we're not scratching our head going, is this motor not good? Does the, do the valve springs not work? Is the timing chain jump or whatever? We know that that's not it. It's not the motor. So that eliminates a lot of things for us to check off our list that we can now look at other things. Yeah, get those likes up. All I have to do is tell people I'll make a dyno run <laughs> if, if we get the likes up. Unfortunately, there's another motor on the dyno that's not one of mine, but it is a big block with a 1271 blower on it. Maybe we'll go and take a look at that. So is a two valve modular spring is like that, Tim? Let's see, 69 charger. I'm gonna keep bugging you until I get an answer. 440 Big Bang. That's that's way, way down on the list. I'm I'm gonna build a 440, but I'm gonna build a stroker version because I have some stuff to do that with that's laying around. So I wanna make that happen. But the 440 Big Bang is not I haven't even done the big block Chevy yet. I need to I need to get that going. I know, James, what's up with that? 188 views and 50 likes. Man, the like count. <laughs> I can't believe how fast the likes jumped up last night when I told people, ah, if you get the likes up, man, I'm, I'll make a poll for you. You guys can watch a poll. And all of a sudden, everybody found the like button. Like, all of a sudden, it just magically appeared. Let's see, Jesse, did you run the 4200 on pump fuel or only, only 85? We didn't run it on pump gas. What size was the turbo in the video? That was the cheap um, eBay GT45, our $163 turbo from DNA. Uh, Calvin, you used 2JZ valve strings. Did you use stock 2J 
valve springs were those better than the um than the 4200 Uh, Billy always hoped these 4200 motors would get a decent aftermarket support. I can tell you what people will probably not be making, and that's long tube headers. <laughs> Steve, we run 140 pounds on the seat, but that's with Jessel solid lifters and rockers. Okay. Yeah, 140 on the seat would be would be more than doubling what's there. Yeah, Mike, these came out of a trailblazer. Uh, could always static load test the motor 100% throttle at 4,000 RPM for 30 to 60 seconds. Why, why would we want to do that? The 3,800 Big Bang will come after this stuff. Would a twin scroll do any good? Well, I don't think a twin scroll is going to do much different than an open one when we have an open tube feeding it. That will burn off any crap. You mean it'll burn off the stuff that would be on the seat, on the valve seats? I think what happens with these is not that it gets debris on it. I think that the seats wear. I think they get pits in them. Uh, 802 Garage, I would like to do the five-cylinder. I think that that would be awesome. I'd like to do the five-cylinder and the four-cylinder once we get this done and show people, hey, it does this kind of cool things and we made a big number with it. I'd like to do the five-cylinder because then we could apply a lot of stuff that we learned um, to the other motors. Uh, Steve, so are you, are you the guy that's doing the, um, sock eliminator stuff? 9,600 and go through just shy of 10,000. That's going good. Yeah, Calvin, that's a good reason to get that motor, 100 bucks. <laughs> Mike says the 440 motor is too much power for, <laughs> for the LS turbo, guys. Uh, Inline four EcoBoost, Big Bang. I haven't, I haven't ever run an EcoBoost motor. I, we, we've run them on the chassis dyno in some of the vehicles, but never on the engine dyno. Why do so many people want to see an engine explode? They don't want to see their own engine explode. They want to see somebody else's engine explode. Overbuilt in the house. The best turbo ever. It, the GT45 really is the um, really is the sloppy stage two of the of the turbo world. See, all I gotta do is keep saying dyno pull and the and the numbers go up. Johnny, if you were to speculate how much power is missing from the dyno sheet due to the condition of the engine, uh, I don't know that there's a lot missing from it, judging by the gain that we got at the boost level relative to the NA power. It may be starting at a lower NA power than it would, but we're going to find out. We'll, we'll put it back in the condition where the valves are fresh and all that stuff. So it will work the way that it's supposed to. And if it makes a little bit more power, then I'll be able to report on that. Overbuilt. Sean, the centrifugal supercharger I like is the Road Roadtrex. Um, th those were good. I know Oscar Jackson very well, and he's done a lot of stuff with the uh, um, Hondas and stuff on those. They're a little bit small for a lot of applications, but for some of those, they work good. I know, right, Andy? Come on, what's up with the likes? Have you ever tested a, Jason wants to know if you've ever tested a vacuum pump for the crankcase. Yeah, we have not on this motor, but um, Brule has done that a lot on uh, big block stuff.
They have a billet wheel dual ball bearing <laughs> GT45. That's the double throwdown whiz bang. Hush puppy, hush puppy shoe wearing al alley cat. Hush puppy shoe wearing crumb cake. Something like that. I can't remember now. Cole Wham alley cat. Hush puppy shoe wearing crumb cake. There we go. Now, now it's all coming back. Uh, I agree. This thing probably does, uh, on an NA application, uh, a uh, tri y header probably would work a lot better. Or six into three into two into one. Six into, yeah, the three into two into one. I help with, out with a rear sump oil pan for these engines. It does, it does appear that that sump is gigantic. I mean, it's so that they can get the four wheel drive stuff going through there, but. Okay, so the Ecotech and the North Star, uh, Steve is saying the Ecotech and the North Star all share the same valve chain geometry. So Steve, on, on your motor, you guys are using, um, the solid lash adjusters or their hydraulic lash adjusters and you guys are using solid versions. Are you using the factory rocker? Yeah, Tim, that's a big change in installed height. Uh, Dustin, everything is stock about it on this motor. It just came from the wrecking yard. It's an 05. Complimentary and sock limiter. Cool. Uh, Zach, I don't know. Uh, Tim was saying that he thought that the 4200 weighs about the same as an aluminum 5.3. I got a bug flying around trying to get me. Shoes with porting and cams, you think you can break 700 horsepower on less than 14 pounds? Uh, honestly, I think that the 06 motor will get very close to that number in stock trim. Uh, Chris, we didn't take the head off of this motor. We took the head off of the 06 motor, and that's because it had um, bad valves and seats and three of the cylinders. Uh, Karen, that's a good choice. That stage two is really good. Jonathan wants to know what transmission can bolt the two. It came with a 4L60E. <laughs> saying dino pull to a car guy is like saying squirrel to, to a gold retriever. I have two gold retrievers. And if you say squirrel, they run right over to the door because they don't want squirrels in their yard. <laughs> that doesn't go. That's the funniest part about that movie. It was Calvin. It was really awesome to see you get a real timing number on the motor. Yeah, we Eric did that stuff. Um, we wanted to find out. We we put it at roughly TDC. I mean, we did it with a you know a screwdriver and stuff. So we did it as close as we could, and then that just became our zero mark. And all we were looking for is to make sure that if the computer says thirty degrees. The, and when we marked it, that it wasn't 90 or that it wasn't zero. We were, you know, we were looking for big amounts, but as it turned out, it was like spot on. Let's see, found out that we are about five degrees shy of what you were running. Eights here, eights, here you come. Uh, well, <laughs> well, Calvin, I, I, yours is working. So I would go up a little bit at a time. Um, but with most things, like if it, that's why we check. And that's the other reason that I was going to say that we check the NA power is the reason that I want to run the motor NA is I want to see how much timing it responds to. If I know how much timing the NA motor wants, then I know kind of where the sweet spot is going to be for, um, timing under boost. Because if a, if a motor wants to make peak power NA, at only 25 degrees, then we're certainly not going to want to run 23 or 24 degrees under boost. 
But if it wants to run at 30 or so like these did and like the LS stuff does, then we know 20 or 21 under boost, especially with the 85 and an intercore is going to, it's going to like that. And what, what we like to do is start out low and then make a pull and then add a little bit and then make a pull and add a little bit, make a little, make a pull. And then, but we also have to have a stopping point because a lot of times what will happen is it keeps wanting to make more and more power. And then you just keep adding more and more timing and you keep making runs. And pretty soon you just let all the magic smoke out. And obviously that's not good. Yep. Uh, we need to flip the pistons. That's what the secret is. Uh, Daniel, I don't know a lot about the Honda automatic transmissions. I always avoided those on the B series and I don't have a lot of experience with the K series. Um, we used to buy a lot of the motors, the JDM stuff that came, you know, they came with automatic transmissions and they would take those off and we just buy the motor and those work fine. But they, I'm told that they had the milder cams in them, but, uh, we were probably going to change those anyway. So it wasn't a big deal for us, but I don't know anything about the automatic transmissions in those. What are your thoughts on conical valve springs? The ones that we've run have all worked. I don't ever, ever remember comparing them directly against something else. Yeah, and, and Mark brought up a good point. The cylinder head temps were, they were about 100 when we were running it, but um, they, it was a lot colder than most people's are. <laughs> yeah, the... the <laughs> The nonsense front sump still bothers Johnny. Jessel, Ecotech, Sol, Lifters. Okay, and Rocker Arms. Okay. Rear sump pans are available. Where are those at, Mark? Something he wants to make a junkyard value towing version of this. Like a 3.5 EcoBoost. I think if you were going to do that, one of the things you might think about if you wanted to make a dedicated like turbo towing motor is you might go a little softer on the compression on these things. Mika Davis, so does this mean six to six into one or eight into one he header doesn't make a power difference? I, I had a conversation with the guys over on the chassis dyno shop and the chassis dyno side of the shop, and they were saying a lot of guys come in with the eight into one headers. But he was saying he thought it actually makes less power than the conventional headers. Now, that's not a back-to-back -back test. That's somebody's opinion. But I, I would like to see that kind of test. I can tell you it sounds really good, and, some, and sometimes that's enough a reason. So if it made a little bit less power but sounded like that, that would be awesome. Yeah, today was pretty warm today. Yeah, this thing runs good. I'm going to send some cams down to Schneider so that they can they can grind them. Okay. Steve is saying the rockers need a bit of modifications, but nothing crazy. I don't think these will need anything for the RPM range that we're planning to do. And I, Kyle is saying that the Alice four cylinder from Colorado with a turbo would make a neat swap for lots of small engine base. I agree. It might be, might package a little better. And I think that, um, I haven't looked into the four cylinder version, but I think that doesn't, does that have dual VVT? Does that have on the intake and the exhaust? How's the state of California treating you guys? Does the, does the state of California come over to our house and buy us drinks and stuff? Uh, Parker, the thing seems to respond to boost well. How do you want, let's see, what do you want to do to it before running more boost? Um, we want to solve whatever that problem was. And also I'm going to take it apart and we're going to put ring gap in it and put another head gasket on it and put head studs on it and maybe put springs in it. Richard, I just jumped on. Did you run the stock exhaust manifold jet? No, we have not run that yet. I ran them NA, but we did not run them with boost. 
<laughs> Mike, who gets to distract all the broken bolts? That's uh, Derek down at LNR. He's going to do that. I think the, the nice thing is all of the head bolts seem to break off pretty flat, like they're not at an angle. So drilling them out and extracting them, I, I, you, a lot of them you can just wiggle around. I can't turn them out like with a screwdriver or anything, but I can see how loose they are. I, I'm sure that if I drilled into those that they would come out. So I don't think it's going to be a big deal. The Ecotech followers are investment cast. Cool. The 4200 needs 42 PSI, just so it's symmetrical and it rolls off the tongue nice. Would love to see what I can make when limited to 93 octane. Um, yeah, you're gonna have to just take timing out of it. A and you'll get a loss from not having the E85 by itself. Uh, Steve, that's right. We were, I read, I have a bunch of videos up on the L99, that 4.3 liter. Can you do another guys on the 3.5 EcoBoost out of an F-150? I haven't seen any of those in the wrecking yard. Just all Ecotech followers or heat treated billet steel. Do we really want a huge turbo laggy setup just because it makes good numbers on a dyno on the street? It's a dog. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Are you? Because <laughs> the GT45 is not a huge turbo. Neither is the GT3582. Neither really is this one. It, I mean, it looks big, but I don't think it's actually very big. The S475 probably would not be what I would choose for this. Although I think Calvin's going to run one. Yeah, but Calvin, you're the smart one. I know that you're running conservative timing, but you're running timing that works. And it's way better to have conservative timing and go out and just like hot lap the thing and have it work than it is to get try to put a hero tune on it. But I think if you would go up one or two numbers and kind of see what happened, especially if you have a good if you have a good intercooler and you're running E85, um, I think you'll probably be fine. Bit of a random question here, but any idea how well those manifolds would weld? It looks like they could be modified relatively easy for a front facing turbo setup. Does anybody know if these are cast iron or cast steel like the um, LS ones? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, John, Mike's right. Um, M-Tech Motorsports um, does make an adapter that allows you to bolt. Uh, as a matter of fact, I can show you that adapter right now because we have it off the motor. So here you go. Super cool. Even got the logo on there. Awesomeness. That allows you to bolt. This bolts to the back of the motor and then allows you to bolt that to a Chevy bell housing. So while we're here, I'm going to do a little unboxing. I don't know, if Ju I haven't seen Julius here. He's gonna miss out. I got a package today <laughs> from my buddy Julius in Australia. Love getting stuff from Australia. And guess what it is? Ta-da! <laughs> Everything you always wanted to know about about Paris, which I'm going to need, hopefully. Falcon Fairlane 2002 to 2008. Falcon BA, BF, six-cylinder, and V8 engines, including LPG and turbo engines, GT, XR6, and XR8, sedan, station wagon, utility, cab chassis, automobile repair manual. So by the time I read this, I will officially be an expert. Thank you, Julius.
Awesome. I can get all the 411 <laughs> on the uh, on the Barra, and then we'll have, be able to accurately compare it to the Amera Barra. Let's see, have you seen Max Performance on YouTube? They tune Barras. I'll have to check it out. I've, I've looked at a lot of Barra stuff lately because I was just, you know, kind of going down the rabbit hole. So when I'm not looking at UFO stuff, then I then I can watch the Barra stuff. Has anyone made any aftermarket upgrades? Like, what do you want, Charles? They do, um, obviously, you can port the head. You can put, um, there are reground cams for it. Uh, M tech does the adapters. They put a, on the Chevy, um, hedge, uh, Calvin, I think just did an intake manifold. I've got an adjustable one too. So if you want to do stuff with it, you can obviously adding boost, you can easily do that using the stock exhaust manifold, just like this. Just don't orient it like this, like I did. <laughs> Has anyone played with the new gen five, 4.3 liter direct injection motor? No, I want to though. Have you ever tried the Ellis style lifter trays they make for a regular roller cam, small box Chevy? I have not. Yeah, I'm scrolling back and reading questions. Should I just go to the end and see what all you guys are really doing? <laughs> okay, now I'm at the end. Ford is ahead of the game. Let's see. Richard, can someone teach you OBS Studio? It's free, so you can do better dynograph videos without the blur lines from the recording a monitor with a camera. Um, normally, what I do is on my, I use my computer at home, and then I can bring up the data, and then I can screen capture that. Here, I've been using the camera to capture it because they don't have that on that computer. And I can't transfer that onto this computer, unfortunately. So it's just a little bit of a difference. But OBS would be good, yeah, if somebody could show me how to do that. We need an EcoBest 2.3 liter four banger and EcoBoost, yeah, all of the EcoBoost. We need, yeah, there's lots of those <laughs> that we'd like to do. A 4.7 liter single overhead cam Dodge, come on. Jesse says, uh, I'm running a GTX 3584 RS on my 4-liter, and it's awesome. Is it a 4-liter Jeep motor, or is it a Barra? Wondering what you thought about Silkmaster. Wondering what you thought about an L36 Series 23800 with an L67 head and supercharger. So you're upgrading. You're basically putting the higher compression NA bottom end and attaching that to the supercharged top end. More compression will help make more power. I don't know about the strength of those two pistons specifically. If one is better than the other, the, the lower compression gives you a little bit more leeway as far as tune. Um, it's a little more forgiving but the higher compression will definitely make more power. Rumors that Chrysler is coming out with an inline six cylinder. Good, more inline six cylinder stuff. Steve V, pros and cons of steel versus aluminum rocker arms. Aluminum is lighter, but steel rocker arms are more rigid. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the design and it also has to do a lot with, none of that may be a, a, a concern because if you're running a rocker with a spring rate and an RPM that the rocker is, you know, a hundred percent stiffer than it needs to be, none, all of that is irrelevant. The lighter rocker is better. If you get up to the limit where you're getting deflection in the rocker, then there's something to talk about there. Uh, Monster on a 383, the 7875 will work good. I don't know. I, I'll have to, I'll send over, I'll do a shout out to Tony and Lucky to see if they're watching. I'll, I'll send a shout out on uh, Instagram or something and see. Uh, Lucky already liked the, the Instagram post, so he know, he, see, he's seen the turbo stuff.
The on the 05 model, the exhaust flow is much worse than I'm told than the 06 version. That the head flow is much worse um, at the power level that we're at. I don't really think that that's an issue. I didn't monitor back pressure, but we will the next time I run it. It, this is a uh, <laughs> stock exhaust manifold and U-pipe. Tom just got done watching Street Outlaws. Well, you got to get your Street Outlaws in, too. Uh, Anthony, that's the other thing we didn't mention is it could there there it might be that we need to adjust VVT, although at the lower boost levels that wasn't an issue. So maybe VVT needs to be adjusted um, differently than we did for the NA motor. Although at 10 or 11 pounds, I I, I can't see that, but it, it would be interesting to test. We just I just didn't have enough time to go through all that sequencing. Yeah, this this turbo looks big, but it's actually a T3. <laughs> Have Buick straight eight. Uh, oh, Calvin, that's right. I forgot about that. That the um, air injection manifold makes the exhaust pulses talk to each other. Well, we want them communicating. So what's next? The Big Bang 4200? That's not going to happen. Uh, flipping the pistons on the Mopar. The Mopar you can see is right over. You can just see the you see the ugliness right past the mop handle, kind of where it belongs. Uh, a lot of that's going to depend on available dyno time. What do you think are better, air to air or air, air to water? As an absolute thing, an air to water is a better intercooler because you can run ice water through it. So you can always get it much colder than ambient, which you can't do on an air to air unless you introduce something that's colder, a transfer medium that's colder than the outside air, like CO2 or nitrous or something. But for a lot of applications, an air to air is a better way to go. If you have a lot of like on a road race car where you have a lot of vehicle speed and it helps cooling, you can do that because you can't really do that on an air to water. That's the problem is the response rate's not good. Um, and but for a drag race application or like we run at Bonneville all the time, the air to water works really good. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I can measure the inducer size or not. Let's see if I can get that in there. I don't know if I have my handy dandy. I don't know if I have my handy dandy calipers here. Let me see. Uh, let's see if I can measure it, Tim. Here we go. I don't know if I can get this in there far enough, and then I can't. Nope. No can do. I'd have to take the cover off to do that. What about a small bang 4200? <laughs> just, just a light one. Uh, I would like to flow test the stock head. Um, I'll have to see if I can set that up. Ray, are you planning to push it to its stock bottom end limits? I don't, I don't know that we'll do a big, we might do a big bang on one of them. Did you watch the latest Faster Problems vid? They discussed the Atlas more. Like always, Jeremy, you repeatedly fingered the ports of the head like an 80s Japanese porn. Um, the the funny thing is, I, it's funny that you bring that up because the I used to do stuff for the guys at Extrude Hone, and they had displays set up at, like at car shows and SEMA and stuff. And it's the same thing with anybody that has a CNC head. If you just stand off to the side, which we've done at the SEMA show, you stand off to the side and walk by, 
every car guy that walks by the head just like, ooh, look at that, look at that. It's all like, it's all billety and shiny and I must touch it. That's the thing. They, they look really cool. Some of that stuff is just way too cool. You don't even want to put it on there because then it's just going to get dirty. It's going to look like this stuff. Jesse says it's a bear. It's also daily for work. Uh, I run it on pump gas, currently tuned at 600 wheel horsepower and 960 newton meters at around 20 PSI. So 20 PSI would be a lot on pump gas. It must have like zero timing in it. Jim, Richard, I'm still running old school on my notchback. Nice. Novi 1000, cam heads, FME, FMU, 430 wheel horsepower on the 128 mile trap speeds. That's kind of like my old setup. Um, we were running, uh, I think my, on my Mustang, I wasn't running 128. I think that we were like 119 or 120 when I took it to the Foxtrot deal with Tom Wilson. Um, I didn't have an FMU then, uh, we had switched over to like 36 pound injectors and the, um, 36 pound pro M meter in front of the blower, but we weren't running very much boost on that, but that was good times though. Yeah. The extrude own stuff is, was really cool. And the, the cool thing about it is cause they did a lot of like five liter Mustang manifolds and all the long runner stuff that you couldn't get in a port. They did a ton of that, um, five liter stuff back in the day. Tom, I think you and Faster Prom should turn this testing into a build and race a 2JZ and a Barra build. Um, I, I'm not qualified to build a car, so that I'm not the right guy for that. <laughs> Tom, do you have any connections with ATI dampener? It would be cool to see you push the air. Let's see, wait, I, I, got, I got lost here. Oh, I need one from H22 and my wife decided she needed a purebred golden retriever. Golden retrievers are nice. Uh, Kyle, even this 05 of questionable heritage and <laughs> or questionable parentage and questionable condition um, makes a lot more than an NA2J does by, by quite a bit, I would imagine. And I think that the 06, a healthy 06, is it should be up, I think, quite a bit from this one. And I think if this were healthy, it would be up too. I was kind of expecting this thing to go over 300, and I was expecting the 06, I think, a, a healthy one to be near 330 or so. Um, so that's a, that's a lot more than a 2J, especially it's a lot more than a 2J if you're starting out with an NA turbo motor, which is gonna be low compression. It's, it's gonna hardly make any power at all. An NA version that has higher compression will make more power, NA obviously, and then when you add boost to it, um, it's just that it doesn't have the low compression and guys don't turn those up maybe as much. Uh, do you know about the Eagles ESP armor surface treatment? If so, what's your opinion on how the smooth polished surface reduces oil windage? What it allows it to do is to shed the oil. So the oil doesn't stay attached and that increases the weight of the thing that is spinning around. So it sheds the oil. So that can work. It, he was talking in Newton meters. Sean, I worked at Pro-Am for a bit. I thought that uh, I bought the dyno when the bank foreclosed on them, started my own business. Very cool. I was doing this stuff back when Bob Atwood owned it, back when it was OG. Let's see, just build the motor and get Calvin, a C4, a C4 Corvette to race faster problems, LT1. Uh, have you got any snakes lately? I haven't, although my mother and father-in-law just sent me a video of another rattlesnake that they found in their backyard. They found one when we were at the at my sister-in-law's wedding. And so we had to catch that and release it and get it out of the way of all of the all of the wedding people, because you know, nobody wants a rattlesnake at a wedding. But I need to go back up. I want to go find some more.
Let's see, NA2JG from a GS300 is like 225 horsepower SA. Uh, Mark saying he doesn't think this motor will fit in a C4 engine bay without major massaging, but that's the thing. It should sit way up out of the hood and stuff, right? <laughs> Calvin, do we have a C4 Corvette? There's actually one sitting over in the wrecking yard over here that has the crossfire injection on it that I really, really want, but I can't keep grabbing things and not getting all the other stuff done. So I, I promised myself that I wouldn't grab it while I was there or, or have somebody even grab it for me. The 4200 is like about this long. Calvin says it's 32 inches. <laughs> Steve has a car we could put it in, right? That thing will hook up, I bet, too. Oh, you saw a rattlesnake today in the South Bay. Yeah, they're they're out. Definitely. Steve, if you want to run one of these turbo motors in one of your cars, um, that <laughs> that would be interesting. Because if we could, I know that your your um, eliminator motor's got to be making, you know, a little bit more than we made out here. But if we had one of these that made seven or eight hundred horsepower, that would kind of be interesting to see what it would do in there. Uh, Richard, you have to fry up and eat rail steaks. Nope, I don't do that. I just catch and release. There's already more than enough people doing that, and and that's not for me. I like the copperheads. The copperheads are kind of cool looking. The one that I'm looking for when I go out mostly is the king snake, the California king snake. That's that's always the the prize. That's always the goal. But we very rarely. I only see three or four of them a year. Uh, I've never run a Ford Triton V10 on the dyno, although I think it would be cool just because it's different. It's definitely other guys. It was pretty warm today, too. It wasn't 95 here today, I don't think. Why am I not plugged in here? See where we're at. Now we're charging. Yeah, the slant six seems like a strange choice for that particular motor, but I mean for that particular vehicle. But you know that's his deal. Um, he likes the Mopar, so putting a Mopar in something like that, it's not a good choice, but it is for him because it, you know lots of people will watch it, so that's a good deal. Have you eaten fried snake? No, ne never. I, and I won't ever either. Oh, Adam's saying I got to go by Willow Springs Raceway for California king snakes. We have them gopher snakes in the animal. Yeah, we got I we catch a lot of gopher snakes, um, but I just don't see a lot of California kings. I've been to Willow Springs a lot. I've raced out there a bunch.
Well, uh, Sean, <laughs> Sean's issue with the slant six is that it has a goofy three three main bearing arrangement. That's not why it's not a good choice for the Miata. <laughs> it's old, it's heavy, it doesn't make any power. It has a lot of other things. I, and I love the Slant 6. I have one, obviously, and we're going to run it. We're going to do some testing on it. Um, and I know guys can do a lot to make power with them. The problem is that, like the head flow, this compared to something like that, any modern motor has you know a, a ton more head flow compared to that stuff. And that ulti ultimately is what limits the power potential. That's no snakes. Oh, Tom, good. I'm glad you reminded me. I'm glad Tom's here. I got another unboxing for you guys. And this one's kind of cool. I might have to bring you guys over here so you guys can take a look. So Tom sent me out something cool for another project because that's what I need is another project. So I'm going to, we're going to go remote. So let's check this out. Yeah. So, so I'm going to ruin this market too. <laughs> cool ability adapters. Yeah, what's up? So this is for putting, uh, Tom, correct me if I'm not r right. Um, I think it's for putting a, an M112 or an M122 um, Eaton supercharger from like an 03 Cobra or from a Shelby, I think. So make sure that, make sure I'm telling this right, uh, Tom. It might be for the Shelby. So putting that on an LS. There's the intake. Whoa. Got our intercooler core under here. So he's made this to adapt readily available. I don't want to ruin the O-rings here. Readily available superchargers, as we'd like to see from eBay and other sources. Like, and I have, um, I have a, an 0304 Cobra, and then the guys at um, Kenny Bell are going to loan me blowers that they have, and I think that they have both early and late GT500 blowers, so we can run that on the, um, can run that on an LS motor, which is kind of cool because you know, boost. Is always good. The name of the company. Tom Demuse, is that did I spell? Did I pronounce that correct, correctly? Demuse Engineering. There's nothing better than ability goodness. So that'll be very cool. And so hopefully I I, <laughs> I do a video on this and I don't ruin the Shelby blower supercharger market. <laughs> that was not my intention. Thanks, Tom, for sending that out. That will be very cool to get that on an LS. I, and I actually kind of want to go get another LS from the wrecking yard. Uh, maybe I don't have a 5.3 currently, so maybe a 5.3. Okay, so Tom is saying an M122 from the GT500. That's good. Yeah, the intake manifold was was nice. Uh, Calvin, I need to get a hold of VMP. I agree. I've seen a lot of their stuff, um, and I, I've never tested one of those blowers. Uh, Terry said, I've seen a lot of King Snakes on the Marine Corps Air Base in Miramar. Oh, cool. Yeah, I've, I've actually seen, um, or in the videos that I've watched uh, and the people that I've talked to, that Southern California seems to have more down there or down here right now. <laughs> Tim's saying, Uncle Tony, Uncle Tony Garage said that adding 200 pounds to the nose of the car would improve handling. <laughs> sure. Because that's what was the, that's what the problem was with the Miata. It wasn't nearly nose heavy enough. Do you think you'll do anything with the seven three Godzilla motor? Maybe I, I I the guys from John Mahovitz from Accufab said that he might have one that we can do some testing on. Sean, I'm in design phase to bring a modern 
poly head to Chrysler small blocks. Okay. So like the early 318 stuff. Richard, do you still have your notch? And if you do, what are the mods? Uh, it doesn't have a motor in it right now, so there's no motor mods. <laughs> it has um, lots of suspension stuff on it, and I'm sure just lots of dust from sitting for the last 10 years. Uh, Tom says he also makes one to fit the Holly Low Ram. Oh, that's cool. I have not tried a Vortec 8100 yet. I've never seen one in the wrecking yard. Sean, do, so do they does do they make aluminum mercury marine heads for the 8100? Does that work for a lightning supercharger? That's different. The lightning was an M90, I think. Or was it a 112? Somebody, it's been a long time since we ran one of those. I think what somebody should do is um, challenge Uncle Tony to a road race <laughs> with his slant six Miata in a regular Miata. Way back in the day, I did a, um, a Miata comparison where we did horsepower versus handling. So we had a Miata and we spent a certain amount of money on shocks and springs and sway bars and tires and stuff. And the tires were the biggest change. Um, and then we also spent that kind of money on, I think we put a supercharger on it to increase the power output. So we wanted to see, and we took them up to Laguna Seca to see which one would go faster around the track. It's hard to beat the handling cart. It had a lot more tire on it. Lightning was a 112. Okay. It's been a long time. I remember we did way back in the day, we did a, this is one of the things that almost that where people tried to get me fired. Um, the Magnuson guys, because it was that car, the magnet or the lightning, we did a Kenny Bell upgrade on it, a twin screw. And then also on a Celine, which Magnuson was supplying the superchargers for Celine. So uh, between those two tests where we did an upgrade and it wasn't like revolutionary, it wasn't rocket science. We put on a bigger blower and it was a twin screw and it made more power and they, they didn't like that. So I said, Richard, you can't be saying that. I said, well, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. Tom, have you ever driven a Miata on the track? I mean, I don't own one and I, I've, I've only driven a couple on, on the racetrack, but they are amazing. I, I, I like a Honda much better. Like that's what I raced. I raced the Del Sol in Motorola Cup and also in US Touring Car and then ran a also a Civic Si. And I like both of those cars. I like driving those on the track better than I like the driving the Miata. The Miata was uh, an oversteer thing and the, the Honda was more of an understeer car. Um, but the Miata does handle very well and it was a blast to drive. I have driven, we drove a Miata in the Silver State that had uh, one of my old World Challenge motors. And when I say World Challenge motors, that sounds really impressive. But, but really, it's just an iron-headed 302 Ford. <laughs> it had dart Windsor Senior heads on it. Um, and it made about 300 at the tire. And we put that motor in because the motor was a monster Miata back in the day. The guys were making those, putting the V8s in them with a six-speed trans and it had a Kenny Bell blower motor in it, and we were going to take it to the to the Silver State race. And I knew that the blower motor was not going to last wide open throttle for that long. So we put our World Challenge motor in, and um, that was a lot of fun. But the handling was not perfect on that. In fact, diabolical is probably a better description, especially at high speeds.
Is a Dodge 3.6 or V6 good for boost? Yes. So anything, any name that you put in there, any en engine designation that you put in there when you have that question, the answer is yes. What's your opinion on carbon ceramic brakes? I actually don't have any experience with those. All of that stuff came out um, after I was doing road racing. We had carbon pads. <laughs> Overbuilt has an 81 RX-7. I like those. Yes, a Miata with a K24 swap would be really good. A 13V rotary with a roof charger pushing by turbo and drive it only idle. Okay. So you have a compound blower turbo 13V rotary? Uh, how much boost do you think the motor will hold? You, you have to do a lot of stuff to make it work with boost. The, the most important thing you have to do is like with these, we put head studs in it and you add ring gap and you have to have the right injector size and E85 and intercooler and lots of stuff. So the amount of boost that it holds, you're gonna break it because something else happened way before you're gonna get to the limit of the motor. Uh, I did see the horsepower monster video on the Jeep four liter turbo. The, we'll do more testing with the Buick 455. So you had a 2001 Silverado factory ceramic brake, sold it with 122,000 miles with the original brake pads still on it. They lasted that long? Jim, he might be able to get up to 73 or 74 miles an hour. <laughs> Wait, you're saying boost is always good and every cam is a boost cam. Can you mail my course completion certificate? We're not all the way there yet. There are two more things to learn, but I can't tell you what they are yet. What, so Fabian, you want to know what the limit of this motor is? Everyone always leaves out valve springs. You On an LS motor, if you're going to do a cam swap, you definitely need valve springs. Any Ecotec versus a BMW N26. Uh, Richard, you are a whirlwind, so many projects, but will the slant six get extensive head porting? I don't know what you mean by extensive. Um, I think I have somebody that offered me a ported head that I could try, which I will do. Elias, you think that a rotary has infinite horsepower potential? Um, the, the apex seals usually go out on those. Just for fun, any testing on a one liter three cylinder Firefly or Geo Metro? I, Silkmaster, come on, are you new here? I, I, am, I am a previous owner of a Chevy Sprint Turbo, not just any Chevy Sprint Turbo, one that we managed to coax over 50 miles per gallon and set two land speed records with. So I'm very familiar with that motor and I've done lots of testing, including compound turboing those. What's your opinion on the 4200 so far? Will the Nova still be getting one? I, it, would be, it would be really good for the Nova.
<laughs> there's three tons of casting flash on the sand si on the slant six. Uh, Tom, don't listen to anybody that tells you that the Honda motors are lacking in torque. They're not lacking in torque for their displacement. Yeah, Dulcich did. <laughs> I talked to Steve about that many, many times. He went through quite a few heads before he, before he didn't go through to water on one of them that he used on the dyno motor. Ooh, a, oh, a mint convertible Chevy Sprint. Are you sure it's a Sprint? Um, if it's a convertible, it's probably a Metro. Yeah, that's what you do. You port till you hit water and then port for about 15 more minutes. Yeah, Dulcich must have a lot of patience for doing I mean, but he's doing that for himself. So I can see why you would do that for yourself and not for a customer or somebody because porting, porting iron slant six heads would not be my idea of having a good time. Tyler wants to know what's your process on choosing lobe sizes on a custom cam. Uh, I usually don't have custom cams done. If I do, um, I just guess. No, we have a fairly good idea of what, of what, like I had a bunch of cams made that you guys may have, um, <laughs> you guys may benefit from being able to buy all of these um, development cams that were run and tested and stuff. Um, but I had a pretty good idea what I wanted to try. Not, not because I'm a cam developer or a designer, um, but because I've run more tests than all of those guys. And so all I have to do is look up the dyno and go, this cam does this, this cam does this. And not just this cam should do this. This cam with these specs does exactly this. And it does this at 2000 RPM or 2500 RPM or 3000, 3500, whatever the number is, it does exactly this. So I have a fairly good like library to look at to decide what I would want in a camshaft, but I don't ever do that. I don't pick cam lobes for people and I don't pick them for myself because I don't need to try that stuff. There's so much testing that I can do that I don't have to get into the like, you know, I get asked all the time, what's better, a custom cam or shelf cam? And People think that there's actually a designation there and there's not uh, any cam that somebody picked at one time was a custom cam and now it's a shelf cam because they tried it and it worked and, and people like it. So when you get into custom cam design, the people that do that um, or the people that want that, usually it's because it's a very crazy kind of application. Um, maybe it's something like this uh, big block that's a certain displacement and they want to run at a certain RPM, they need a certain power level and they have a certain kind of induction system and then you want to <laughs> team that to the camshaft. But here's the thing, you'll get, especially cam designers do this all the time. They, they say, oh yeah, my cam just went the fastest, whatever the next part of the statement is, stock block, you know, stick car, whatever it is. And what a lot of people don't realize, they think that that cam has like magical properties, that the reason that that car did all of that was because of the camshaft. And if you would have picked a cam that was two degrees different than that, it still would have done that. And, and a lot of people don't realize that, that I've tested lots and lots of cams that are different in intake opening and intake closing and in exhaust opening as exhaust closing and lift and duration and LSA but the specs are close enough that they do the same thing. So any of those cams that you put in these combinations that set whatever records that they set 
would have done exactly the same thing. And it could have been designed by five or six or seven different people, and they all would have done the same thing. So keep that in mind when you're talking about getting custom cams done. Let's see, take the factory cam and add a percent or take a bit more when there's not available grinds. It, Tyler, the easiest way for me, the way I look at it is you tell me what motor you have and how much power you want and like what the rest of the things are if you have the rest of the things. Like I get questions all the time. Hey, Richard, I got a 5.3 with stock heads and uh, this throttle body and it's going in a truck and you know I want this kind of power. I tell them, okay, you can't do that. You can't get 600 horsepower from a 5.3. But what you can get is if you put this cam in it, it will do this. And this is about the most cam that you could put in. So usually if somebody tells me what power they want, I can give them a pretty good idea on what cam they need. Richard, try and get a hold of Ray Bates for the 4200 adjustable intake cam gear. I, I can try that. I'm actually not really interested in putting, uh, making a modification like that that would be so specialized. I would be much more interested in testing, m physically moving the cam, something that the average guy could could do and might think about doing. And then that way I can show him whether or not that's a good idea. Uh, I want to do a Honda V6. I want to do the 3.2 liter or 3.5 liter in the the element or one of those. Um, and that is also on the list. Uh, Tim wants a J35 Honda engine in the Nova with a trans brake and slicks. <laughs> Any experience with the Terminator X? I never run that. We always run the um, a Holly HP or a Dominator. They say it's self-learning. I don't. I don't like the closed loop self-tuning thing. We. I always tune everything myself. Are there any head gasket that can be reused? Factory slant six. Thin steel shim gaskets are pretty rare now. And I've been told you can sometimes reuse. We reuse um, MLS head gaskets all the time. Have you run a root supercharger with pushing on top of it by a turbo? Yes, we have. Um, i have not on a rotary, but I did it on an O3 Cobra. So we had twin turbos feeding the factory Eaton supercharger. Honestly, I don't think you need a root supercharger on your rotary in addition to the turbo. A turbo rotary by itself is really fun. Yeah, Tim, that's what I want to do. I'd like to try to change one tooth and see um, if, if, if we advance or if we retard it, I think we probably have piston to valve clearance to play with there. So I'd like to see what happens if it um, picks up power. Have you ever used an inertia dyno? A lot of the chassis dynos are like that. And so we reuse lots and lots of those. I have my own dyno jet, so we've run, I've run endless runs on those. Uh, Paul, we did close the gap up on the spark plugs. Um, the small exhaust ports are not going to be restricting it at this power level. We could make way more power than that. Um, it could have back pressure. Uh, that could be part of it. But I don't think that the, you know, everybody's saying about the exhaust ports, but that I'm sure that they flow enough for this power level. The gains for moving an intake cam aren't near as impressive as moving the exhaust cam. From my experience, the exhaust cam is where it's at for power. Now, see, the I find exactly the opposite on the um, like on the Honda B series stuff. The intake cam seems to get much bigger gains than the exhaust. Do 
The retrofit hydraulic roller usually is a link bar lifter. And on some of the Ford stuff, I think it was also a smaller base circle so that the lifters would be down in a non hydraulic roller block. I think that that's what it was. Your red Silverado likely has factory ceramic brakes. So is it not the rotors, right? You're talking about pads. I've already changed the pads in my truck and I didn't put ceramic ones in it. Yeah, Sean, my Nova came with a six cylinder in it. On a, on a two stroke diesel with the turbo and the supercharger, that's a good combination. Calvin said, I retarded the intake cam one tooth, didn't seem to push the power higher in the RPM range like I wanted it to. Did you see any change? Did you do it on the dyno, Calvin, to see if there was any change in power? Ever thought of the Oldsmobile twin cam 3.4 liter? I've never run those. I did run, run the tool, twin dual cam Pontiac motor, if that's a similar thing. Yeah, Tim, that's a good suggestion for Vernon. Just get a factory roller block because they're cheap. Go get an Explorer. If you get an Explorer, that'll be way better than your 289. If you have boost escaping through the coolant jacket, a head gasket or warping, can you add torque to the headsets? You can. Uh, you can. We've run. We've run the torque up on ARP headsets before. You know, because if it if they call for 75, if you go to 80 or 85, then that means <laughs> that means it's tighter, right? Um, unfortunately, like on a five liter Mustang where we were doing it, all it does is warp the deck even more and makes makes life much worse. So make sure you're not doing that, either warping the head deck or the deck in the block. Um, and if you have you, you probably don't have boost escaping. If you have boost escaping, you have a big problem. If you have um, like combustion pressure escaping, uh, you've probably detonated it. I have one of the LS4 front wheel drive intake manifolds and I need to test it. I just haven't done it yet. So you want the root supercharger to eliminate the lag. Your the compound setup can work. It's going to be it's going to be difficult to make work really well though. Yeah, ceramic pads are very common. We've been using those forever. Um, we used to use I think we used to use Hawk pads on the reds or blues. I can't remember on the on the Del Sol. And those lasted a long time. The pads lasted longer than the rotors did. Uh, I have not tried an Audi 4.2 liter. Okay, Calvin. We'll we'll try that. If I we were just looking at this, and I was trying to figure out a way that I could um, cut the front cover so that we could uh, make cam swaps much easier, um, kind of like with the what we do with the the LS motors, have a two piece timing cover on it. If I could do that, that would be nice, um, and make cam swaps and things easier, and head swaps because we're going to be doing some of that, and also it would make it easy for us to you know, change it by one tooth um, because having to take the whole thing apart every time just makes you not want to do it as many times. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, a Nissan Motors would be cool. I do have an RB25. Talk to Mark about his manual timing chain tensioner. Okay, I'll have to buy, I'll have to hit Mark up and buy one of those. Yeah, I'm excited about running the RB2. It's been sitting for a long time. I haven't tried any of the Nissan V8s. Yeah, if you put twin GT45s on in, in anything that's not a sizable motor like a big block, it's it's not going to be very responsive. Will the RRB25 bolt to the Dynat West Egg? Yeah, I've already taken care of that. We have a bell housing that um, will mount to a T56, and so that bell housing will bolt to the dyno, and then it also bolts to the RB. The RB25 I can't I got is a JDM one. A 3800 in the jet boat. Yeah, the ceramic carbon rotor stuff, um, the carbon carbon stuff, like they were using that in Formula One for years, and it's um they work really well as long as they're hot and they're really, really expensive. <laughs> Have you done part throttle timing tests? Supposedly it can cause lots of heat having a low timing of part throttle. Normally part, if you look at any of the factory stuff, if you watch that while you're cruising down the road, the timing values are very, very high at part throttle. <laughs> We're talking about every engine, Evan, but only for two more minutes because I have to. Why do you guys keep it on here so long, man? There are other factory RB engines. I would actually like to test an RB20 because that's the very small displacement one. And for a two liter motor, we were looking at that for Bonneville and we thought that that would be a good application. But the 25, the 26, and the 30, they're all available and they all do different things. The 30 is the big block version. The RB26 is the really expensive one. Tom, thank you for sending it. <laughs> An RB Big Bang motor, not my RB25. Thanks, Mark. Got a number of CAD studies to do tomorrow. <laughs> my cat attacked a possum. Uh, one of my golden retrievers, the male, got a possum um, a year or so back. But he didn't get it because my wife called me and said, yeah, Milo just got a possum. I said, you know what? I want you to walk back out there and tell me if it's still there. She said, oh, no, I think he got it. And so they walked back out there and it was not there. So he was indeed playing possum. Australia's in the house. The RB26 also has um, twin turbos and the head's different. Thanks for being here, Calvin. 
I'll send over that information on the um, on the valve springs. I just need to measure the retainer to seal clearance, and then hopefully, if you if you need to use that, and then um, I just need to get the information on the. Hopefully, I'll get an email to get the information on the spring upgrade because I'd like to do that. I'd like to do that on both motors. We may as well do it and see what happens. Um, even if that doesn't cure the problem, if that was a problem, we would cure it. Yeah, and Calvin sent me a picture of the, because that's the other thing I need to do. We need to configure the front so I can run the stock water pump so we can not have to do the force feeding deal and not have to run this thing at 100 degrees. I've never run, I don't know if West Tech has run a Pontiac overhead cam. I, the only guy that may have done it was... Um, Ken Croce from HO Racing, but he normally does the 400s and 389s and 455s and stuff. Uh, Matt, I, I don't think that GM didn't do it because there wasn't power. GM was doing the exhaust cam primarily for emissions um, and EGR probably. So they didn't do that. There is more power to be had. Obviously, they could have made the head flow more. They could have put wilder cam timing. There's a lot of things that they could have changed to make more power. That's easy. They needed to meet a number of goals. One of them was power, and that was probably the easiest part. But it was uh, NVH and fuel mileage and emissions and longevity and lot and and temperature and you know all kinds of things. So I think that there could be power from changing that cam, but we'll have to see. And what we may find out is if we ad if we advance it, maybe it adds power at one point and takes away power at another point. If we retard it, it may do the opposite thing. Uh, it may do nothing. It may do something. <laughs> That's why you test it, though. <laughs> you're you're having possum for dinner. Nice. I would like to do the Pontiac straight the Pontiac straight six. They're hard to find, though. An Iron Duke. There's probably Iron Dukes in the in the wrecking yard, I would imagine. I do have a Sprint engine. I still have my one liter turbo Sprint motor. I just have the motor, though. Yeah, if they would have got the valve seat material or the hardening process better, that would have been nice. Uh, Donnie, 230 or 240-ish intake duration on a 383 with a 256, 260 CFM intake head. Uh, what, what is it you're trying to do with that? 230 to 240 is right in the wheelhouse for a 383. Is it going to be a street car? Uh, Tom, actually the longevity might be better with the stiffer rod. Because the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is it's not just a strength, like you can bend it or crack it. Um, it's also a frequency in the rod. <laughs> Did the 300 fall out of the truck on its way to West Tech? It may have. I know that the the um, the other 4200 um, definitely fell over. They dropped it in the back of the truck. <laughs> Pushing supercharger with the turbo was it multiplying the boost. It does when you it, that it's compounding it basically. So uh, when we did the O3 Cobra motor, and this will be the last question, when we did the O3 Cobra motor, unless people come in with a whole bunch of super chats money, I'm out of here. <laughs> Make sure to push the like button. Um, on the O3 Cobra motor, we ran seven pounds of boost from the turbo, feeding the because we ran the blower by itself and we ran the turbo by itself, running 11 pounds from the blower. 
and the combined effort was not 18 pounds. It was like 21 or 22 pounds. So it did compound the boost going into the motor. <laughs> Richard your road map to 350 horsepower with a stock L98 with a tune port, no force induction or nitrous. That's actually easy to get 350 flywheel horsepower. Yeah, see, John, now we're doing good, huh? We got a good ratio. All you have to do is wait long enough and then the viewers come down and so that it makes the it makes the likes look even better. Eight people didn't like it. What's going? What's up with that? Yeah, 2.2 .2 Chrysler would definitely be good. Okay, guys, I got to get going. I got a lot of stuff. I actually have to load this motor up in my truck and then the 06 also up in my truck to get them ready to take to the machine shop for tomorrow. And plus, I got a lot of stuff I got to clean up. Thanks, guys, for showing up. I will see you tomorrow.